Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Daniel, how are you? Good, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Propaganda Inco Studios here in Temple Terrace, Florida. It's not the most lavish studio, but what do you think of the place? Really professional, really nice. Yeah. Enjoying it. Got a cozy, homey vibe. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, good. I think we should just hop right into the thick of it. So the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, has labeled you an anti-Semite and a supporter of terrorism. Now, usually when the ADL comes after Muslims who are critical of Zionism, it's like a badge of honor. Not because you're actually anti-Semitic. Obviously, you're not. And you're not obviously a supporter of terrorism. But it's a badge of honor because usually when they come after you, it's because you are quite effective at what you do. On the flip side, it's very concerning because when they put you in their crosshairs, it can mean that danger is on the horizon. They can come after you in many different ways. So I'd like to hear from you about why you think they've placed you in their crosshairs, what sort of influence they have, and how this might impact your career. I was very surprised um, that they would call me out. I was very surprised that Jonathan Greenblatt would call me out. This is a guy who is literally having meetings with uh, Elon Musk, people of that caliber. So me, you know, there's nothing in comparison on the grand scheme of politics in the West. So the fact that they would name me specifically was shocking. Um, why are they targeting me? I think that what um, I've been able to do with the Muslim skeptic team, um, we've had uh, debates on Judaism and Zionism. I've given a presentation on, at Queens College, which resulted in a lot of controversy with Zionist groups trying to cancel that and even the administration getting involved in the president of Queens College sending out a mass email to all students that, oh, Daniel is coming to campus and we denounce his views. That was shocking also. Um, but then we're debating Zionism and Judaism in a way that's hard to rebut, in a way that's hard to respond to. And in reality, we're just turning the tables because for ever since 9-11, there's been this media operation to demonize Islam, to demonize Muslims. And it's involved a lot of this argument that Islam is inherently violent, misogynistic, intolerant, and we're going to uh, demonize Muslims. Why? Because we want to invade the Middle East. We want to have these wars in the Middle East. Um, now we've turned the tables. Okay, let's look at Jewish religious texts, Judaism, you've been playing this game where Zionists have been criticizing the Quran, criticizing the Prophet Sallallahu What is, peace be upon him, like, that's been their whole MO. And now we're turning the tables and asking, well, look at what it says in the Torah. Look at what it says in the Talmud. And I think this has really been a sensitive spot. Usually you see commentators who are critiquing Zionism. They're doing a great job, but they keep it at the political level. But if you take it to the level of, well, this is what Judaism as a religion teaches, this is what you read in the scriptures, and this is actually informing the behavior of the Zionist state in apartheid and genocide policies towards the Palestinians, then that becomes a very explosive situation for them. So tell me how these debates have gone on campus. I read a couple of tweets of yours. Uh, apparently it wasn't as uh, chaotic as you thought it might be. After all the drama, they tried to get you canceled and said this would be an event that really shouldn't take place. It could cause issues. But then you had some pretty cordial conversations, I think, with some students. Is that correct? Yeah, that's been mostly my experience because um, I've spoken on campuses before and there, there can be protests. There can be um, petitions to get the event canceled. But when you actually go to the event or the venue, it's just keyboard warriors. They don't actually show up. Um, so when I got to Queens College, there was one, uh, I think, Jewish man who had a huge Israeli flag and he was handing out flyers like this is who Daniel Hayraju is. Mm. And there was just one person. And then I go, we go to the uh, hall and there's a lot of Muslim students, a lot of Jewish students, some seems like rabbis and other kinds of religious figures. And I just give my talk. They ask questions. It was mostly respectful, went off without a hitch. So I think people, when they see you in person and they interact with you in person, then that's a different vibe than just online. And I think it's, it's positive. So what are some things from Jewish scripture, from the Torah or the Talmud, that you've been pointing out and kind of shedding some light on? Well, what we find uh, within both the Torah 
um, and the Talmud is this kind of racial supremacy um, of Jews being a superior race uh, to others and non-Jews being inferior. Some uh, religious texts will actually describe uh, Jews as being semi-divine um, and non-Jews having a kind of demonic soul. So if you, especially if you go to the Zohar, which is another very important Jewish text. Um, and this is a recurring theme. So this is not all Jews accept this belief. We should make that very clear. But there are some Jews who do accept it. And we wouldn't care and we wouldn't be talking about it if there wasn't a genocide going on in Palestine. The fact that there's a genocide going on and you have figures like Benjamin Netanyahu, um, ben Gavir, other members of the Knesset in Israel who are using this kind of genocidal language and they're quoting the Bible. They're talking about Palestinians as Amalek, for example, Amalekites, um, which is invoking genocide because the Bible um, talks about in Deuteronomy and elsewhere about the Amalekites, which were a, a race that in the Torah, God supposedly commands to for the uh, Jews to wipe out including man, woman, and child. Um, and this is supposed to be an act of revenge for what the Amalek did to the Jews. But within Jewish theology, um, the, the rabbis interpreted Amalek as anyone who is the enemy of, of Jews. Mm -hmm. So it's not a specific people in the past that are long gone. It can be applied over and over again to different groups. So the Nazis were called Amalek. Um, the Palestinians are now being called Amalek. Benjamin Netanyahu is specifically saying uh, to his uh, country that do not forget Amalek in this war against Palestine. Do not forget Amalek. So that is a clear call to genocide, given what Amalek means in the Bible and throughout Jewish history. The Zohar, is that Talmud? Is that Torah? Can you explain the difference between the two? The Zohar is, a, uh, is dedicated to Kabbalah and spiritualism it comes much later um, in jewish history but it's attributed falsely you know academics say it's a false attribution to earlier rabbis so um this but it still is very influential and it focuses on spiritual matters and you'll find you know very interesting things about god and theology um, and the soul for example in, in the zohar that aren't necessarily in the Talmud or the Torah. So this is not actually Jewish creed. This is an interpretation by certain figures in Jewish history of what they interpret to be Jewish creed. Is that correct? Not exactly. It is considered like a text um, that is divinely inspired, like the Talmud. Um, the Talmud, for example, is often said by people who either are lying or they're trying to or they really don't know that the Talmud, oh, it's just what, a bunch of what rabbis have said, their opinions, and it, it really means nothing. That's actually false. The Talmud is understood to be the oral law, which was revealed. So there's a written law, which is the Torah, um, and the oral law. And they both were revealed uh, allegedly to Moses. Obviously, as Muslims, we believe that uh, Moses got, got revelation. But in, in Jewish theology, there's the oral law and the written law. Both of them are revealed. The written law is the text. But the oral law is passed down orally uh, from Moses up until the early rabbis. We're talking in the, you know, the um, first century to the sixth century. Those are the early rabbis. And then that those early rabbis uh, compile that oral law into what becomes the Talmud, uh, the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. So the, this the Zohar and these ideas that you're talking about of a, like a Jewish supremacy and the call to wipe out the Amaleks and interpreting any potential enemy of the Jews, regardless of which time period they're in, to potentially be the Amaleks and therefore subject to the threat of annihilation and genocide and uh, viewing non-Jews as demonic. Is that the type of ideology that is fueling rabbis talking to the IDF, for example, telling them that Palestinians aren't even worth your fingernail? Is that yeah, the connection? Absolutely. Like this is the kind of ideology that uh, generates so much terrorism against Palestinians. Because as we know, all this didn't start on October 7th. You have the history of Israel literally being founded on terrorism um, and 
we see that rhetoric being used from Judaism to justify, for example, when um, West Bank settlers attack Palestinians, commit arson, you know, randomly murder Palestinian children, um, you know, over 2000 acts of violence like this, which should be considered terrorism, but they're not described like that in the mainstream media. These acts of terrorism on Palestinians in the West Bank um, are justified on the basis of this religious interpretation. Um, so obviously not all Israelis will accept, you know, that extreme type of interpretation of, of Judaism, but the people who are committing these acts of terror against Palestinians, and they have for years, are inspired by these religious texts, and the rabbis are teaching those texts. Mm. So how can we not talk about those texts? And the thing is that Zionists have have set the precedent of tying political action and political violence to texts. So they say that, well, look at Al-Qaeda, look at ISIS. They're a problem because they follow the Quran. And that's why we have to be suspicious of all Muslims and all Muslims are potential terrorists because they believe in the Quran and they're reciting the Quran. Mm -hmm. So we have to have that eye of suspicion. And that's how they justified so many of the policies against Muslims, the Islamophobic policies justifying the uh, countering violent extremism, CVE policies, for example, in the war on terror, not only in the West, but even in Muslim countries, adopting those same standards that if you're a religious Muslim, that means you care about the Quran. And if you care about the Quran, that means you have more potential to commit acts of terror. That was the logic that was used. So you've set the pres precedent and Zionists and neocons were the ones behind this idea. So why wouldn't we have the same calculus for looking at how Jewish violence is connected to Jewish texts? It seems like you either ban any discussion of religious texts in context of uh, political violence, or you don't have a double standard. If you want to talk about Islamic terrorism, quote unquote, and bring in the Quran and bring in Hadith, then we should be able to do the same thing with Judaism. But the problem is these Zionists and people like the, at the ADL, they want this double standard where, fine, we criticize the Quran and Islam, but you don't are not allowed to talk about our text because that's anti-Semitic. So is it because of what you're saying right now and the fact that you're having these types of discussions on college campuses, do you think this is why the ADL has made you a target? That's what I can only assume, because there are a lot of people who are criticizing Zionism, Zionist policies. They're going through Israeli politics. They're bringing up, they're literally, you know, going to the ICJ and making a case. Um, but I don't see as many people talking about the Jewish texts and this Jewish religious tradition. And there seems to be a, a sensitivity to that. And, and I can understand where it's coming from, actually. And I can sympathize in a weird way, because uh, if you look at the history of the Jewish people, uh, attacks against Jews predate Zionism, you know, and there has been a type of anti-Semitism uh, directed towards Jews in Europe, for example, and other places. And a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it is just out of pure hatred and also um, a kind of belief that Jews are backwards in the sense that they're not assimilating. Uh, because if you look back in history, Jews were ghettoized and they were their own communities surrounded by a larger European minority. And this, this a lot of the things that Muslims experience nowadays with, uh, you know, People uh, right wing or maybe even in Europe saying nationalistic movement saying that why, why don't Muslims assimilate like Muslims believe in Sharia law. Muslims believe in covering their women. Those kinds of stereotypes and attacks. Um, similar things were directed towards Jews, actually. Um, and it was based on their religious teachings like, well, they do believe in a religious law as well. They do believe in certain practices and gender roles that were not common in Europe, especially post enlightenment. So that kind of hatred predates, uh, in a sense, Zionism. So it's even more sensitive uh, when you actually do criticize Judaism uh, because of that. But again, it's, it's a double standard. If you're as Zionists or, or, or Jewish commentators, Jewish academics criticizing the Quran, trying to connect it to violence, political violence, and pushing this kind of larger agenda, Islamophobic agenda, whether it's to serve endless wars in the Middle East or whatever, then you should by the same token, be fine with Muslims 
and others critiquing the Jewish texts. The ADL presents themselves as being not just against anti-Semitism, but against anti-black racism, uh, discrimination against the LGBTQ community. You've argued that uh, although they present themselves as being concerned about Islamophobia, that they're actually quite Islamophobic themselves. Can you explain how? Well, their Islamophobia is in the fact that, for example, by characterizing me as a bigot um, and an extremist, what is the basis for that when I'm just expressing Islamic beliefs, you know, standard Islamic beliefs? As a Muslim, I believe in gender roles. Islam is a uh, is a religion where gender roles are built into the, the law, the Islamic law. And if you're a Muslim, you abide by Islamic law in, in your submission to the religion. Um, similarly with homosexuality. Islam condemns homosexuality. And as a Muslim, you have that position. So if I express that position, like that's my belief, if you're saying that that's bigoted, okay, then you're saying that Islam as a religion is bigoted and that it should be banned or it's not allowed in polite society. That's fine. Make the rules clear. Don't pretend like you are tolerant of Islam on the one hand, but you also want Muslims to give up and censor beliefs that don't match with your ideology or your worldview. You can't have your cake and eat it too, right? So that's the problem with, with Western tolerance. Um, you know, their tolerance for Muslims doesn't really extend beyond what they consider to be right and wrong. Muslims in Afghanistan, for example, their women dress in a certain way. They have a certain culture. They have a certain value system. Well, we don't accept that. That's not consistent with our human rights, our definitions. Therefore, we're justified in bombing you, droning you, and forcing you to change. Okay, so how is that tolerant? You know, how is that this enlightened tolerance that you are uh, presuming of yourself? It's all hypocrisy. It's all hypocrisy. And this, especially post October 7th, this idea of tolerance and a rule based order and the West is so concerned with human rights. Everyone has been disabused of that nonsense. Like, OK, now we see what's really going on. It's, this is this is a rule based order when it favors you. But if it's Muslim children being killed, if it's Palestinians being literally starved to death, and your world leaders are complicit and they won't say a word, then you can take your rules-based order and shove it. I know you debated Robert Spencer recently on the PPD podcast. Can you talk about who Robert Spencer is and then tell us a little bit about how your debate went down with him? Sure. So Robert Spencer is one of these chief Islamophobes, and he's had a long history of attacking Muslims, attacking Islam. <laughs> spreading all kinds of lies and bigoted nonsense about Islam. Uh, but he was involved with the government. Uh, he was involved with informing the government about Islam. And he had this kind of, enjoyed this kind of position. And then he kind of fell out of favor eventually. Um, but he has this history of contributing to the war on terror against Muslims, this, um, this mentality of countering violent extremism. And there was, I've been challenging him to debate for years. And he would always have some excuse, no, I'm not gonna debate, some excuse not to debate. This opportunity uh, with uh, Patrick Bet David, he wanted to have like a Christian Muslim debate uh, on his podcast. And originally, uh, Muhammad Hijab um, from the UK was supposed to come and debate Robert Spencer and some other Christians. Uh, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Um, so he promoted me to Patrick and said, oh, why, why don't you have Daniel? So I was there. Also, Jake, um, you might know Jake Brancatella. He was there as well. And we were us two Muslims against Pat, um, not Patrick, but uh, Robert and this Rashid guy. This, he's a Moroccan who's very popular in the Arab world as this kind of uh, troll, basically but he's more popular in Arabic than in English. But for some reason, he found himself sitting next to Robert Spencer. And what's funny is that they had like no rapport, which was strange. Like you're on the same side debating as Christians, but they didn't really seem to like each other. And so we go to um, Miami for this and we don't meet Patrick until it's like showtime. And then we come into the studio and then we just meet him for the first time. He's really nice, uh, a really sociable type of guy. 
and we sit and then, you know, the conversation starts. But if it hadn't been in that venue, if it hadn't been Patrick Bet David and Robert Spencer being the worm that he is, not wanting to miss that exposure, he would have dodged. He would still would have dodged me, you know, to prevent any kind of confrontation. And then we saw what happens. Like it was a complete disaster for his uh, image as an expert on Islam and religion. So yeah, he's a he's a charlatan, but it was really satisfying seeing him squirm. And what is his connection to, if not the ADL, but other Zionist groups, like through this funding network? You're familiar, of course, with the Fear Inc. report, the Center for American Progress. They did this report on the Islamophobia network and all the funding and and how it spreads from different groups to think tanks to activists to people like him. Uh, So can you talk a little bit about his connection to the entire like Zionist Islamophobic network? So he's connected, I believe, it's been a while since I reviewed that report, but the David Horowitz Foundation, I believe, is what it's called. David Horowitz is the main person, uh, hardcore Zionist. And they fund people like Spencer, also Pam Geller, um, Daniel Pipes and the Middle East Forum. Um, And they've all done like articles and hit pieces on me, basically. Um, But they've been branded, especially post-Trump, as you know, Islamophobes, uh, and they're not seen as respectable figures in the way that they were in the Bush era and maybe early in the Obama era. Basically, um, towards the end of the Obama second term and early Trump days, this idea of Muslims as a protected minority, that was something new. So the younger generation of Muslims might not realize, but this type of animosity towards Islam was really common and like depicting Muslims as terrorists in like respectable media, mainstream media, that was extremely common. And it was only in a sense because Trump came on the scene and Trump is spewing like this kind of anti-Islamophobic, anti-Muslim nonsense. He's talking about a Muslim ban. And because the mainstream establishment hates Trump so much, they were willing to say, okay, no, Muslims are, you know, our friends and Muslims are important, special people. And if Trump is attacking them, that shows how bigoted and, and evil Trump is. So they, u- they're using Muslims kind of as a weapon against Trump. So we benefited from that. And uh, this kind of outright Islamophobia obviously was, has always been a part of the mainstream media, but it became more taboo. And figures like Robert Spencer and Pam Geller, the kind of political position they had as like respectable members of of that class, they're kind of ostracized because they're just too far. Mm -hmm. And groups like the ADL, on the other hand, they're able to shift from being more like Robert Spencer to no, 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 no. We're about protecting, you know, Muslims, too, from Islamophobia and LGBT. And like they evolved uh, in order to stay within the uh, political establishment. So now they're the ones who, when they come out with a hit piece, uh, more people will pay attention as opposed to the kinds of hit pieces that come from Daniel Pipes or Robert Spencer. Not to spook you or make you think about the worst case scenario, but uh, groups like the ADL can definitely get people like you deplatformed, debanked, demonetized. We've seen that with many different uh, individuals. What are some things that you think they may potentially do to you in your career? They seem to have that kind of goal um, to deplatform, uh, demonetize, etc. The thing is that, to the best of my knowledge, I'm the first native-born American Muslim that they have targeted in this way. So this is something that is new, uh, it seems, for them. And the kinds of claims that they're making are so bogus, like to say that I'm an anti-Semite when I have a long record of saying that, look, my criticism is of Judaism. It's not a racial critique. Not all Jews have these beliefs. But to twist that and say that's anti-Semitic, people see through that. It's very transparently uh, politically motivated. You just don't want someone to criticize your Zionist agenda. So we'll see what happens. You know, I'm praying for the the best, but we're also seeking legal action um, against them for defamation because they are also, you know, what they are uh, 
claiming about me is that I support terrorist groups or that I'm involved with terrorism somehow. So this is defamatory. I have a again a clear record of speaking against terrorism. I was you know writing against ISIS ten years ago, <laughs> so this is something that is defamatory as well. And it's interesting because um, if you look at the ADL, they're connected to Middle Eastern governments um, and a specific government um, in the Gulf that has an ADL center, <laughs> and a the ADL works in that country for the pur supposed purposes of like regional tolerance, etc. It's clearly a Zionist front. And this particular Gulf country has a history of uh, launching extremism accusations against American Muslim groups mm -hmm. that for whatever reason they don't like for their own political purpose. Mm. So it may be actually that there is a specific Gulf country that is involved with the ADL because they don't like my criticism of secularization happening in the Muslim world and, and the kind of Zionist secular, secularization where you are not only trying to secularize the Muslim population in these Arab countries, but you're also trying to normalize through the Abraham Accords and elsewhere with the Zionist state. Mm -hmm. So that's a sensitive spot too. And I think there might be some involvement of these regimes with the ADL against me. I want to segue more into that conversation, I guess, through this uh, individual you've uh, deemed or termed uh, Rabbi Ferris. But before we talk about him, I want to ask you about the ADL, Elon Musk X, and this conversation now that's taking place about free speech versus reach. So prior to October 7th, the ADL and a coalition of different groups threatened to pull advertising from X as soon as Elon acquired Twitter because they claimed that there was a rise in hate speech and that Elon was uh, fomenting that or festering that and he wasn't addressing it and they saw a rise of anti-Semitism, so they claim, and they wanted to pull advertising, but they never did so. Then October 7th happens and Palestine content is like flying on, on Twitter. Our videos were going viral left and right. Our reach has since been suppressed, like many other people have been experiencing posting about Palestine. But at the time, it was performing really, really well. And then I think the the straw that broke the camel's back for Elon and ADL is when he got on the Lex Friedman podcast. I don't know if you remember this, but he ha he made a very small comment that was incredibly reasonable. I'm going to paraphrase it, but essentially... It was something along the lines of violence begets violence. So if Israel kills someone in Gaza, they create five more fighters. So if you want to stop creating fighters and the need to fight, then you should, you know, maybe take a more peaceful approach. That was essentially his message. And that clip went viral and a lot of people saw it as, oh, Elon is allowing Palestine content to go viral. And now he's like seemingly criticizing Israel's response in Gaza. Uh, shortly after this, advertisers actually pulled out of X and this put Elon in a position where he was panicking and he goes on the propaganda tour in Israel. He's at the kibbutz and then he's at Auschwitz with Ben Shapiro. And then all of a sudden pro-Palestine accounts start getting censored on X. And so his argument has been, well, I'm not really censoring speech, even though some people have been outright banned ever since then. But he's saying, I'm not really censoring your speech. I'm limiting your reach. You have the right to say whatever you want. You don't have the right for every, anyone to hear it, though. So what is your take on that entire situation between Elon, the ADL, free speech. Well, has he actually come out and said, I'm limiting Palestinian reach? I don't think he's no, actually he's never said, said it. No, he's never said that directly, but there's been this conversation about yeah, speech Yeah, there's a and wider reach. principle that he gave, because uh, I was, act before Elon took over, mm -hmm. I was had been banned from Twitter for some bogus reason, um, but uh, I was reinstated. And I experienced the same thing, like posts on related to Palestine were going viral, um, getting hundreds of thousands of views very easily. Um, but then suddenly there's a switch that was turned off and then you can barely get, you know, 10 percent of the same kind of reach. So it's very obvious that something changed with their algorithm. Uh, and then you look at the Israeli accounts and they're at the same level, if not more so. Even the, like their viewership, because that's a different metric, like the impressions that you get versus the likes. Mm -hmm. So the likes and the reposts that those Israeli accounts are getting don't justify 500,000, 1 million, 8 million impressions. Uh, so people have noticed this kind of uh, discrepancy. 
And I would prefer the kind of methods of X and Elon Musk as opposed to like Meta. Like Meta will just outright, they don't even care (laughs) if you protest, they'll just take you off completely. Mm -hmm. Even YouTube to a certain extent, um, even though they're not as bad as Meta, they'll just take you off. But so it's the better of two possible worlds. Um, I think Elon having control of the platform is better than if it was just a corporate uh, entity like Meta or these other big tech companies. But the phenomenon, you know, it just proves that if people are allowed to freely talk, a lot of the narratives that um, are given so much weight would collapse. It's like this whole bubble phenomenon, like the pro Zion, the idea that the world is backing Israel. That's like a bubble, like it's just inflation, like by artificial inflation from the media and from social media algorithms and from mainstream news saying that, oh, yeah, there's a equivalence here between Israel and Palestine and Israel is dealing with a really difficult situation. They're the only democracy in the Middle East. Like that kind of narrative is so empty and so bogus. It just takes like a couple of uh, Twitter accounts to debunk it and then reach (laughs) millions of people. So you have to clamp that down Mm -hmm. in order to keep the bubble sustained. Um, And so that's what Elon has had to do. But despite that uh, algorithm manipulation, uh, still we see so much um, we see so much animosity towards the genocide that Israel is conducting. And that is a big change from the past. Um, I don't know if you felt it because you've been active for uh, quite a while as well in these spaces, I feel like things have really changed with how people understand this whole quote unquote conflict. The images of dying children, the images of mutilated bodies, even the mainstream news is feeling the pressure to report these atrocities in a way that isn't so biased because it's just so outrageous what Israel is doing that even they feel like they have to have some level of even handedness. And I see older generations in October 7th, like they were pro-Israel. Now they're completely against Israel. They're like, Israel needs to stop. This is disgusting. What are they doing? It's like their eyes have been opened. And so this is a complete PR disaster collapse of the bubble for Israel. And I think that's what's partly uh, pushing them to commit even more atrocities because they're like, well, we've lost all our credibility, so we might as well just go all the way. Yeah, we need to make the most of this situation. I agree with you. I've noticed it as well. I've been like involved in Palestine activism for 14 years now since about 2010 and i can tell you as an activist and uh, an organizer in the past all we could celebrate is the narrative is changing the narrative is changing that's all we could celebrate and so i agree the narrative has been changing and it's changing at a rate that it's it's never been this fast before and their narrative has never collapsed so uh enormously before this is a complete and utter pr disaster as you've described it Of course, you know, I wish we could move on from just changing the narrative and actually change what's happening on the ground. But that takes time. It's a, you know, generational effort as I've had to learn over the years. But definitely the narrative is changing. And the way I view it is the biggest defeat that the Zionists are facing is that they've had to reveal how much power they have. Because you can't challenge power if you don't know where the power lies. And we as a community, because we've been attacked by Zionists for so long, we've known who, you know, who has a lot of power. Uh, Not to say they have all the power, but they have a tremendous amount of power, especially in the West and the United States specifically. And we have been victims of that. Like we have members of our community who are Palestine activists and organizers who spent life in prison or were deported. Their families were destroyed. Communities were destroyed. Our community in Tampa, you know, suffered from Zionist attacks on our community leaders and you know, entire families were destroyed, mosques lost great leadership. And so we've been affected by that. And so we've always known, but now I think average Americans are waking up to it. So definitely I agree with you there. There has been a shift. So let's talk now about Rabbi Ferris. I don't follow that story way, you know, close enough, but I do see you from time to time uh, just trolling him on Twitter and I, I find it entertaining. And I try to hear him out and see like, what is this guy actually saying? So my understanding is that he, he tries to make the argument that boycotts don't really work, and he tries to use the explanation of, like, franchise. you're hurting a local business owner through a franchise. And actually, he's not the only person to think that. There are BDS activists, actually, who have said, oh, you shouldn't target Coca-Cola, even though they have factories in the West Bank in settlements, um, because really, if you 
boycott Coca-Cola in Morocco, you're hurting the franchisee owner in Morocco and you're not actually affecting the, the corporation in the West Bank. So talk to us about Rabbi Ferris and how he's used, I guess, to usher in this era of normalization and why his boycott argument is nonsense. So Rabbi Ferris, he deserves the title of rabbi, uh, as we'll see. I'll explain it. But basically, he's in the UAE. He is on the government's payroll there. Um, literally, because you can't be a public preacher in uh, UAE and some of these other states unless you have a license from the government. Um, So whatever he says and preaches, you can assume is government approved unless the next day he's in prison. So if he's not in prison, that means it's coming straight from the government. Uh, His initial uh, position and what he announced, and he stood by that to this day, is that boycotting in itself is haram. Like it's impermissible. And uh, he announced this. Um, he didn't, he, at first he didn't localize it to, oh, this is hurting local businesses. He just meant in general, like you shouldn't be boycotting. And he gave some stupid argument to justify that. And no one had heard of this ever before in the history of Islam. Like you uh, can make your own decision on what you do, buy or don't buy. Um, and then he escalated the argument in a way too. He said that not only is it haram, but it also makes you a Khariji, like it makes you, and without going into the whole detail of who the Khawarij is, but it makes you basically like a terrorist. Mm. Like you are an enemy of the state <laughs> if, if, you, if you're boycotting <laughs> Israel. It's just, yeah, it, it makes you laugh when you hear about it. And there are literally Zionist accounts who are tweeting him and saying, or retweeting rather, and saying that, oh, look, this imam... Mm is uh, giving the fatwa that boycotting Israel is haram. So Mm. why aren't Muslims listening to their religious leadership? Mm. So even the Zionists were promoting uh, this clown. And the thing is, he's not like a scholar. He's not an imam. Uh, He has a lot of followers on TikTok. But he was, in as late as 2017, he was a CrossFit trainer. Like, he had a CrossFit gym. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, he has, he's not like this religious scholar that has training. So he claims that he had, oh, I've studied with the scholars and whatever. Even if that is the case, like, very recently, like, your whole line of work was something completely different. Like, mm-hmm. how did you transfer from CrossFit trainer to, you know, Dai or, like, Imam? So it's very shady anyway. That that aside, but what he's saying is so patently ridiculous mm-hmm. that boycotting makes you a, pot- a potential terrorist. And he just keeps doubling down. He just keeps doubling down on this narrative. He he laughs at the idea of boycotting, like making jokes about it. Like um, he's been on like podcasts with like Starbucks or someone else was drinking Starbucks and they just have a good laugh. And that kind of attitude is so despicable, like as Muslims are dying and people, Muslims around the world, people in general around the world are trying to make a difference. They're trying to help and you're laughing and mocking their efforts. Right. So he, you know, and and if he like personally believe that boycotting is wrong or for his country, it's wrong. That's fine for him. It's just his mistake, but he's going out of his way to label Muslims around the world as terrorists uh, for for boycotting. So that that tells you that it's not just a religious opinion. Like he's politicized and he's being, you know, there's a bigger agenda that he is serving for him to go out and say that at such a sensitive, crucial time. So why did you label him rabbi? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not saying that he's not a Muslim. Uh, I'm not doing tech fear of him. Uh, but, you know, you get the title that you deserve when you've been serving the Zionist interest in this mm-hmm. kind of outrageous way. And the boycott thing is only one thing. Like he has a record and I don't want to go through his whole history, but he has a record of statements that are shocking in this time. Like uh, he ma- he uh, made comments making light of the death of Palestinians. He's like he tweeted that, well. He didn't mention Palestinians specifically, but he said like, well, in, in World War One, this many people died. In World War Two, this many people died. People die. We, we move, move on with life. You know, that kind of comment in the, at the beginning of this war, people, are, Muslim, Palestinian Muslims are being genocided and you are flippant about it. Uh, he, you know, has that kind of attitude. It's just disgusting. Transitioning now, you're familiar with the Red Heifer sacrifice, of course. So have you seen our video? Of course. You have. Okay. So I knew nothing about this a couple of months ago. 
And it was actually this um, Twitter account and this Instagram page that we collaborate with sometimes in terms of doing research, Propaganda vs. Truth. They're massive on Instagram, great channel, I think operated by a husband and wife, really good people. And they messaged me and they said, hey, did you hear about this red heifer thing? You know, they made an announcement marking 100 days and they cited one of the reasons, the justifications for the October 7th attack was the sacrifice of the red heifers. Do you want to do a video on it? If you do, here's some research we can provide you with. So I sat on it for a bit and I started doing research and I was like, oh my God, this is crazier than I thought. And I started digging deeper and deeper. And I made this video and it, it performed really well because apparently it's a trending topic, not just for Muslims, but it's a trending topic for Christians and Jews as well. And everyone is interested in the topic for different reasons. So Muslims view it as like this apocalyptic catastrophic event. Some Christians view it, there's debate of course, but some Christians say Jesus is the temple. There is no temple that should be rebuilt. Uh, so we don't actually believe this. Other Christians are like, no, we do need the temple to be rebuilt because we need Jesus to return and he won't return unless there's a temple. And then of course you have Jews who we're like, it's part of our faith. We have to rebuild the temple and the Messiah will come back, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone is, you know, interested in this topic for different reasons. But because of that, it was trending and our video went viral. It's our most watched video on YouTube. Talk to us about the red heifer sacrifice. Is there anything we miss in our video or what do you want the audience to understand about this red heifer sacrifice and how it ties to the temple and potentially, you know, a much more catastrophic situation? I think what you covered in the video is pretty comprehensive. Like that—that that is basically what the red heifer is supposed to be. It's supposed to purify uh, for the construction, the reconstruction of the temple. This will be the third temple. So all of that is accurate. Um, this, I think, what can really be emphasized more is the role of the Messiah and the idea of the Messiah, because that's where things really get um, hot. You could say for all three religions. Uh, because Muslims and Christians agree that the Messiah is Jesus Christ. But the Jewish idea of a Messiah, um, they obviously rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, but they believe that the Messiah is, that is the figure that is going to bring, you know, the whole world under Jewish rule. And they view this as like a positive thing, like this will be peace and, and justice for the entire world. But the idea is that the Messiah will come and uh, build the temple. Like those two events coincide. Some say the Messiah comes first. Others say the temple is built first. But the role of the Messiah and his position to as this figure who is messianic, like the messianic age, which will involve violence, which will involve war, the Messiah is the one that's going to usher that in. Now, Muslims and Christians also believe that with variations. But what's interesting is the intersection, because according to Islam, the Messiah comes, Jesus Christ will return to earth, and his first major act is going to be kill the Antichrist, or the Dajjal, Masih Dajjal, which uh, Dajjal means like deceiver um, or, or arch deceiver. And so the when Jesus returns and he kills the Antichrist. Well, who is this Antichrist figure? And what's interesting is that Christians, the earliest Christian theologians, like Irenaeus, believe that the Antichrist was Jewish, which is interesting. And other early um, church fathers also believe that the Antichrist is Jewish. Um, Muslim, according to some traditions, the Antichrist also has a Jewish lineage, or a lot of his followers are going to be Jewish, which is interesting because obviously, according to Judaism, the Messiah is going to be a Jew and is going to be followed by Jews. Another interesting fact is that within Judaism, the Messiah is sometimes described as the son of God. Um, the uh, Messiah is from the line of David, and in the Old Testament or, or the Hebrew Bible, David is sometimes described as the son of God. And the messianic figures are considered to be sons of God, or is, sometimes is this metaphorical, God. or is this literal? They actually believe the literal. Son of God. Well, I mean, the language is literal, like it's the son of God. Mm. Um, so, I mean, this is I had a whole debate recently on whether Judaism is really monotheistic or not, and mm. pointed out a lot of examples of polytheism that you find within the Old Testament, within the Hebrew Bible. Um, you know, a lot of language in the Hebrew Bible is uh, polytheistic or henotheistic, and they do have this idea of sons of God, 
that doesn't become the dominant interpretation of rabbinic Judaism after the sixth century, but they still have that within their books and that in their tradition. So we experienced some technical difficulties, unfortunately. I should have done a better job clearing the SD card. So if you ever want to do a podcast, okay, don't sit down with a great guest like Daniel Hakikuchu. How do you pronounce your last name correctly, actually? You did a great job. Yeah. Is that Hakikuchu, you could pronounce it with like a more Hakikuchu? Yeah. This is the way? Yeah. Okay. Well, when you sit down with a guest like this, you got to make sure there are no interruptions. He was riffing. We were talking about the Mehdi, the end of the world, <laughs> and it was all ruined because of this. But, you know, since we pause, I might as well tell you about today's sponsor, the Dajjal. He would like to recruit you to his demonic and satanic army so he can destroy the world. And he wants to recruit you. And he sponsored this video. And for $500, we're willing to join his mission. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, you know, since we're on the topic, I'm going to try to bring us back to what we were talking about the Dajjal is he like the most epic troll of all time why does he what is his mission his intent obviously you know a test from God right but mm -hmm. if we were to put ourselves in his shoe does he have some type of childhood trauma not to joke too much about it but seriously what's his deal and he's like let me just come and end the world like what's this guy's story so as for his motivations and intentions Allahu Alam Allah knows best but um, his, he primarily works through deception and he is going to come to dominate and control the entire globe. And the narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam make it very clear that those who follow him will experience prosperity and wealth and those who reject him will suffer poverty and they will suffer from hunger and destitution. So it's the greatest fitna. It's, it's one of the greatest fit, fitan or tr trials and tribulations that humanity will face. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why he's known. Like all prophets warned about the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And the Prophet Muhammad was that's no awesome. different. And he gave us the most description of who this person is. And one of the, the other defining characteristic of the Antichrist is that he is one-eyed. And what does that mean, one-eyed? There's a misconception that him being one-eyed means that he's a, like a cyclops, like with one big eye in the center of his head. That's not it. He has two eyes, but one eye is deformed. Uh, it's a defective eye, and it's like sunken like a grape. And that's what the n authentic narrations say. So, um, And then how you know that he's a liar is that he's one-eyed, but God, Allah, is not one-eyed. Right. Allah is not one eyed. And that's that's the wording of the narration. So that what's significant about this Antichrist and how it intersects with the red heifer issue, the temple issue, waiting for the Messiah issue, is that in the Islamic tradition, we know that the Antichrist will claim to be a Messiah. He'll claim to be a son of God and divine. And then eventually he'll claim to be God himself. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is that the Messiah that is being waited for by Jews, according to the Jewish tradition, also has been described as a son of God and even God within the uh, Hebrew Bible. And in a recent debate that I had, uh, I bring in these texts and I quote them, and I make the argument that we have this kind of false impression, especially as Muslims, that, well, Christianity is Trinitarian, Hinduism has polytheism, but Judaism and Islam, those are the only two monotheistic religions. But this is a misconception because within Judaism, there is a long, there's like a monotheistic strand, but there's also a polytheistic strand. There's a henotheistic strand. They do have language within the Torah of uh, there being a divine council of gods, there being sons of God, like what those, is that kind of language. What is henotheistic? Henotheism is the idea that many gods exist, but you worship uh, one God. Mm. Like there is. One, so there's this idea that um, within uh, Judaism prior to the 6th century, so according to Jewish belief, Moses came in 1500 BC, 15, 1300, roughly that time. But by the 6th century BCE, what uh, archaeological findings have, have shown and biblical scholars and uh, archaeologists show is that Jews at that time were very polytheistic and they believed in a head god named El and, uh, and his divine wife, Asherah. And they had sons. They had like 70 sons. And one of those sons was Yahweh. 
Mm. And Yao and each son was assigned to like a people. So, but the people, the Jewish people had Yahweh as their, as their God, but there's like a whole pantheon of gods basically. Mm -hmm. And then over time, as later Jews tried to reconcile the monotheistic strands and the polytheistic strands, they kind of combined this idea of El and Yahweh. It's really one God. Yahweh was basically promoted to this position of being the head God. Mm. Um, because this is the, this is what Muslims, uh, take for granted sometimes like, are, yeah, we do have like difference of opinion on certain aspects of theology, but it's like differences of, okay, well, how do we interpret the Arsh, like the throne of God? Like, what does that really mean? Like, is it a literal throne or is it something metaphorical or, or th that's like the range of disagreement theologically that we find amongst Muslims. But when you look at Judaism or Christianity, like in Judaism, their like their debates are historically: is there like one God, or is it like a pantheon of gods, or is there like that's that's a huge difference? And when they're trying to reconcile that historically and come up with like one manuscript or one text of the Bible, you have a lot of things that you have to edit out. Mm. You have to edit out the polytheism. But there's always a paper trail. There's always remnants that, oh, you missed, you know, that verse. And that verse talks about a, a council of gods mm. or that verse talks about the sons of God. You missed that when you were trying to, you know, reinterpret everything according to monotheism. So that's the way that biblical scholars will actually study the Bible and they'll look at different uh, variants of the Bible because you have the the main Bible that. Uh, Jews uh, read today is based on the Masoretic text. It's a specific variant of the Bible, but there's also other variants like the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered, and it kind of blew biblical s studies out the water because you have a, you know, a Hebrew Bible, and it has these major variations with what the Bible that um, people read today, even though the Dead Sea Scrolls are dated earlier. So there are different variants of the variants of the Bible. That's another problem that Muslims don't have, alhamdulillah, with the Qur'an. Before we had the technical difficulty, we were talking about the Mahdi, because we were talking about the convergence of these different eschatological opinions, right, Islamically, in terms of Christianity, Judaism, and they converge onto this single point. So what I asked you was about how Muslims will be able to recognize a Mahdi figure, and I don't think we had discussed the Mahdi prior, so you'll have to explain to the audience, like, who the Mahdi is and how Muslims will be able to identify this ca character, believe this person to be truly the Mahdi, and then follow them and then enter the fray with the rest of these forces. Sure, yeah, this is very important because the Mahdi is supposed to be, it's not the Messiah, so Muslims and Christians agree, the Messiah is Jesus Christ, but the Mahdi is a figure that uh, comes before, right <clears throat> before the Messiah, and he's just a righteous Muslim leader and he has certain characteristics that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has described for, so that people will recognize uh, who he is. Um, but he is considered to be the uh, first of the major signs because uh, what do we mean by major sign versus minor signs? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us a description of what is going to happen before the day of judgment, before the world is going to completely end. And there are minor signs like people are going to be um, generally more immoral. There's going to be more sexual deviance. People will fornicate in the streets. There's going to be a lack of trustworthiness. These are all minor signs. The building of tall buildings in competition that the Prophet Sallallahu said in an authentic hadith that uh, the Bedouins of basically Arabia will compete with each other in building taller and taller buildings something that we actually see so these are the minor signs then the major signs are things like the coming of the antichrist the coming of the messiah jesus christ when he literally will come down from heaven on on two angels um things like gog and magog or yet juj and met juj which are mentioned in the quran and also in hadith these are the major signs catas cataclysmic events and the first of the major signs is imam mahdi which is this righteous figure and he has different characteristics. One of the characteristics is that he is not going to seek leadership. He's not going to try to gather people to follow him. He will be forced into a position of leadership. Like the Muslims will force him and he just doesn't want it. He'll actually be fleeing away from leadership, but they force him into it. So that's one of the uh, central characteristics of the Mahdi. 
Um, and there, there are other signs of like who it is, but one of the signs is that there will even be a kind of voice, like a definitive voice that says, this is the Mahdi. Now, whether that's authentic or not, I don't know, uh, but that's one of the characteristics. But the point is that it'll be very clear cut that this person, uh, um, you know, something unprecedented in history, unprecedented where uh, we haven't had a figure like that, and then there will be a figure like that, and Muslims will have a choice. Do I follow, you know, what is the clear truth by following the Mahdi or will I just sit it out? Will I just avoid, uh, you know, making the sacrifices that are required to follow a leader? And a lot of Muslims might think that, oh, if I was in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of course I'd follow the Prophet. Of course I'd be the best Sahabi. You know, I'd be the best companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, but would you, you know, you have to ask yourself, would you really be willing to dedicate your life and put your family uh, on the back burner, your wealth, your business and sacrifice for the sake of Allah, for the sake of God and follow a prophet? That's the kind of commitment that the Sahaba made. And that's what makes them the greatest generation. Um, if we want to be counted as being great uh, followers of Islam and servants of God, are we going to be in that position where we follow the Mahdi when it's clear to us that that person is the Imam Mahdi? There's a requirement that if you're a Muslim, you have to support him in, in the same way that if you were a Muslim in the time of the Prophet you had to support him, you had to fight with him. In a similar way, there will be that same requirement uh, for Muslims. It will be wajib. Who is going to actually do what's wajib and who's going to turn their uh, his or her back? That will be the question that all Muslims at that time will have to face. So what does the Mahdi do? He's going to lead the Muslims to victory, military victory, uh, basically establishing God's rule by um, taking over certain Muslim lands. Because the understanding is that Muslim lands are going to be uh, controlled by forces that are not going to be Muslim. It's the forces of uh, disbelief or whatever. And the Mahdi is going to lead Muslims to take over, reconquer those areas and establish like a Muslim uh, rulership. And this is prior to the coming of the Messiah. Yes, that's prior to the coming of uh, Jesus Christ. So okay. what's going to happen is, you know, what the hadith described, the exact timeline, there's going to be ikhtilaf. Um, scholars will disagree on what the exact timeline is, but there's like a general sense that uh, Imam Mahdi is first. He's going to have a lot of success. Um, there will be people who will attack the Mahdi because the Mahdi will be located in Mecca. And then there will be a great army that will come to attack the Mahdi. And then at that point, the earth will actually swallow that great army up. Mm. So you think that there's this dominant force that's going to come with, you know, who knows what kind of weapons, well, you know, artillery force coming with their whatever they might have at that time. And you have a small ragtag team mm -hmm. uh, following the Mahdi. They're going to get crushed. They're going to get destroyed. But no, the, the earth will s literally swallow up that army. And it's interesting because... You know, what does that actually mean uh, when you look at a country like Arabia today? There are things like sinkholes. There are things like giant sinkholes that can open up, especially if you've been drilling underneath the earth for a long period of time. Mm. So Allahu Alam, only God knows what can happen. But these are the kinds of things that are described about the Mahdi and the end of times. So you described potential modern weaponry like artillery. Um, but my understanding, and obviously I don't know what I'm talking about, but from what I've heard is there'll be some sort of return to like ancient warfare. Is that during the Mahdi's time? Is that even true? There are different opinions on that. Some will say, some say the view that you mentioned that thing will return to more primitive uh, technological period and fighting will be done with spears and swords on horseback, etc. And some say, no, you know, it's it's going to be through using modern weaponry. Uh, only Allah knows. But either way, like the sequence of events and, and what's really happening, like what the core of what's happening is the forces of belief and Islam versus the forces that want to wipe Islam off the face of the earth. 
Mm. Um, so how that actually that conflict takes place, uh, it could be either way. I'm not sure like which opinion is correct, but um, the sequence is what import is important. And this idea of an antichrist and a, a messiah and the Mahdi, like these are the things that we're seeing uh, actually start to materialize with what's happening with the red heifers, what's happening with the Al-Aqsa um, and just the world opinion about mm. people have a sense, like a tangible sense, like something is happening. Like things are leading to a breaking point. What is that? And it's like people even, I'm not just talking about Muslims, definitely Muslims, but even non-Muslims, it feels like, okay, something big is about to happen and we're just holding our breath. Mm. I don't know. Do you feel like that? I do. <laughs> I do. And I've been telling my friends for a long time. Um, we're we're going to, for the rest of our lives, experience instability and chaos and tension. And I mostly view it that way just because of the rise of China and Russia and entering a multipolar world. You have, you know, the collapse of the unipolar world and you have these great forces that are going to be fighting very aggressively over what resources are left on Earth and they're going to be competing for Africa and Asia. And so we've seen proxy wars. We're going to start to see more of those kinds of proxy wars and sprinkled into this is religion and end of times. And, you know, obviously Israel is playing a major role in this. I think they're literally the heart of this. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely view it that way. So can you, I want to talk a little bit more about this because I know this is going to be really interesting to people, but where is their cause for confusion? Because you have, and I know th th you're dealing off uh, weak hadith, uh, different opinions, interpretations, and then it's not very clear, but you have within Islam itself, you'll have the Shia and Sunni, right? Differing on who the Mahdi might be and how to agree upon that. Then you have the Christians who will decide who the Messiah actually is, uh, who the Dajjal is, and then the Jews have their own interpretation about who the Dajjal will be, who the Messiah will be. So could you try to speculate, if you were to tell me what you think might happen, how it might go down, given all of these different converging groups and their, their interpretations, how might it happen? I think that... Um what could happen, Allahu Adam, is that, I don't know, maybe in the next 100 years, um, Muslims have suffered uh, a lot of defeats, a lot of fracturing, um, a lot of loss of life, genocides, and oppression. And um, that will wake up the Ummah. And we see that awakening happening right now as we speak. Uh, Muslims are waking up and realizing that this life is a uh, is an illusion, that they've been deluding into buying into this idea of you know the modern world order, and we have to be modernized and we have to actually turn our back to religion in order to achieve prosperity. And now Muslims are realizing that that was all a lie. That when you turn your back to Islam and to Allah, that you will destroy yourself and you will actually suffer. A uh, great deal of loss by doing that. So they're waking up, and that awakening is going to cause, inshallah, a chain reaction of um, just more activity, more strength, more strength through Iman and Taqwa and all of these important values. Muslims are slowly going to get more united. And as that happens, there will be big changes. Like there's a huge opportunity for Muslims, especially as these powers start to crumble for Muslims to take a center role in defining the next 100 years. And it's really for us, it's for us for the taking. Um, it's for us to meet that challenge. And I think that awakening is actually happening. So if that happens, when that happens, there's another narration. Um, I don't know if it's a narration or a saying from um, previous scholars that when the Mahdi comes, the Mahdi is going to come to an uh, Ummah of Mahdis. The Mahdi will come like he is a, this great leader who will come to a community of great leaders. 
So that's why as Muslims, we can never be passive and say that, oh, well, let's just wait until the Mahdi comes. No, you have to change yourself and you have to be a, a great person and strive for the best uh, in terms of dunya and akhirah. And then Allah will bring the leader and then Allah will bless you with someone to lead. And if you do the opposite, you turn your back on Allah, you don't care about deen, then you'll have oppressive leaders and you'll have terrible leaders that you'll be cursed with. So when that awakening happens, Muslims become stronger and stronger, then a Mahdi could come. And then that's the first of the major signs that will lead to a domino effect for everything else that comes after. So I'd like to segue now into something we were talking about earlier today when we picked you up from the airport. You were talking about how it's incredibly well documented the amount of genocides Muslims have experienced just in the last like hundred years. And you gave some examples about like the Indonesian genocide, the Algerian genocide. Can you talk about that and the work that you you and the Muslim skeptics are, are doing to document this and share it with people and for what purpose? There are a lot of genocides that Muslims have suffered that are well documented academically, but there's no wider awareness of these genocides. And what that ends up doing is there has been a concerted media effort, um, you know, from the beginning of colonialism, really, the past over 200 years, but even to this day with the war on terror, etc., to demonize Muslims and make it seem like Muslims are the villains of history and, and Muslims are violent and they just kill, kill, kill. And the historical reality is the opposite. Muslims have been the greatest victims of slaughter, massacre, and genocide, especially over the past 200 years. And it's mostly been due to uh, colonialism. Uh, it's mostly been due to the rise of communism. A lot of genocides have taken place because of communism in Central Asia specifically and, and the Caucasus, etc. The rise of liberalism, authoritarian liberalism, that's what really is the cause of the Algerian genocide. It wasn't Christians who were genociding the Algerians in the 19th century. It was the French liberals, the uh, enlightened liberal uh, d advocates of democracy who were trying to bring utopia to Algeria and teach them that you know their religion is backwards they need to accept equality and democracy and secularism there were th that was the party responsible for the genocide of the algerians so um that history needs to be covered it needs to be um uh, disseminated for the wider population to really understand how Muslims have been uh, attacked and killed in this historical period and who was really the main uh, proponent of those genocides and perpetrator of those genocides. It's this liberal system, this dominant liberal, uh, secular, modern system that has been portrayed as the savior of human civilization. We were in the backwards dark ages of religion and then we discovered science and reason with the enlightenment and then the whole world accepted democracy and human rights and everything was just beautiful. This is the narrative, the historical narrative that feeds into uh, this superiority of liberal secularism and the dominance of liberal secular powers in the West, such as the U.S. and, and Europe. But in order to break that false dominance, that false idol, you have to question the history. And part of questioning that history is like, OK, how did this omelet get made? The mm -hmm. omelet was made by killing and slaughtering and genociding Muslims and forcing them uh, to accept this system whether it was like this kind of liberal secular system, the communist system within Asia, look at the, the, the uh, killing of Muslims in the Caucasus and Russia, in Albania, in China. Like this history has to be uh, discussed. And that's what at Muslim Skeptic, we have the Muslim Genocide Awareness Project and we have documentary style videos going through the history. And we make sure to cite everything with academic, uh, peer-reviewed sources, so that there's no question that the data is completely solid. The numbers, you know, if you want to claim that, anyone can claim, oh, you, you murdered a million of our people. Uh, you murdered two million. You can give any kind of random number, but so what? Like, what is your justification for that? 
and we want to bring the the highest quality sources to justify like okay when we say that three million indonesians were murdered and genocided we're not just making it up when we say six million or seven million algerians over 200 years were genocided or not 200 years 100 years by the french this is justified because of this historical book this historical book this documentary record all of these sources that cannot be disputed because they're academic they're non-muslim academic sources we were talking earlier about liberal democracy in islam and you were talking about how they're they aren't compatible can you elaborate on that the to keep it short um liberalism as a philosophy uh, began in the enlightenment at the turn of the 19th century um, it's related to modernism, the idea that really what determines right and wrong is the human mind. It's not some book from heaven. It's not what God says. The human mind determines what's right and wrong. And what determines what's right and wrong is maximizing freedom and maximizing equality. And as long as you do that, then, then eventually you'll reach utopia. Uh, that's what liberalism is based off of. And when you look at like American politics, when I say liberalism, I don't mean like left wing uh, or Democrats. Every par political party in the West is liberal in the sense, in the philosophical sense of liberal, because they are, they all are uh, operating under the same premise of maximizing people's freedom. So when Donald Trump or the Republicans say that we increase people's freedom by giving them Second Amendment gun rights, Okay, that's their understanding of how to maximize freedom, whereas the Democrats will say, no, 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 that that infringes on other people's rights. Mm -hmm. So that's not consistent with maximizing freedom and equality. But they're all debating about the same thing, how to maximize freedom and equality. Mm -hmm. the, the theological model and other philosophies as well that predate liberalism uh, operate on a completely different basis. It's not necessarily what maximizes freedom and equality there are other important values like what about the uh, value of um, family what about the value of marriage what about the value of your community what about the value of god and worshiping god these are human values that are not necessarily served by maximizing freedom and equality in fact they're harmed sometimes if you maximize freedom like the idea that you can pursue your pleasures as much as you want, as long as you don't harm anyone. If you maximize that, marriages will suffer. In fact, marriages will break down because for marriage to work, you have to have a kind of commitment to the other person and not uh, engage in adultery and cheat on the other person. Uh, if you do engage in that be behavior, then the marriage dissolves, right? So if you want to preserve marriage, you have to restrict people's rights. Or you have to restrict people's choices and say, no, no, you're married, don't commit adultery. And in fact, we're going to have punishments for you if you commit fornication or adultery in order to preserve marriage, in order to preserve family. So you can see how that restriction, like Islam will restrict a person by saying, if you commit you know, adultery, you're going to get punished. Uh, you're going to face some kind of punishment for that. That will restrict a person's individual freedom but it supports and protects the institution of marriage because marriage is also valuable. And what we see in today's society is that, well, marriage is almost extinct. In fact, many sociologists have made dire statements that marriage is extinct completely uh, because people aren't getting married. They don't want to get married. And when they do get married, they get divorced uh, very quickly. Majority of marriages end up in divorce. So that shows that this kind of policy of maximizing people's freedom and equality can actually destroy other important human institutions like the institution of family how can you have this uh, a family um, if you if people are maximizing their own individual freedoms above everything else like being a father for example means you sacrifice for your family like you go and do a hard job in order to make ends meet so your kids will have food and they'll have a good life and your wife will have a good life you have to sacrifice what your personal desires are in order to support a family. Whereas if you prioritize your own personal desires, you might say, well, I always had the dream of being a movie star, or I always had the dream of being like a world traveler. And so if I want to support a wife and kids, that's going to infringe on my dreams. I don't want to do that. I want to live a free life. I want to see the world. I want to go and you know buy whatever new technology and, and enjoy life. And you see that attitude very common amongst youth. 
because they've been conditioned uh, to this kind of self-serving, individual freedom, my life, my choices types of mindset. And that's contrary to marriage. That's contrary to family. That's contrary to belief in God and, and submitting yourself to God. Like, why should I submit to God? Like, I have my own life. Like, those kinds of sentiments uh, and, and wanting to sacrifice and putting these other values first, that's gone out the window. And it's because of this entire cultural, ideological system of liberalism. That's, uh, you know, I've written uh, books about this. I've written articles about this. It's literally destroying the human race. Very interesting. I want to bring this up. We were talking earlier about the amount of money that Zionist organizations spend in America to influence politicians and to advance the cause of supporting the state of Israel. And it's projected that they spend about 50 to $65 million a year. And this year, because of the genocide that's taking place, they have reportedly committed up to $100 million to uh, inject into the political system and much of which is to try and take out the politicians from the quote unquote progressive squad uh, that has actually, you know, been as vocal as one can be in Congress. And we were talking about, you know, because of the wealth of Muslims in America, why can't Muslims inject that kind of cash, meet that maybe half of that? Uh, why can't Muslims compete? And you had some thoughts about this. So can you elaborate? I believe that Muslims should be involved, must be involved with politics. But how do we define politics? And I think that there's a narrow understanding of politics as electoral politics. Like we have to have representation um, in Congress. We have to have representation in the state legislatures, etc., or a parliament or whatever it may be. That kind of mindset is very naive because it assumes that, oh, if there's a token Muslim sitting in that parliament seat or that Congress seat, then our interests are suddenly going to be served by that person. But that's just not how politics works. Politics work uh, through influence and influence works through money. And Muslims in terms of their wealth in America cannot compete with the wealth of other groups like the Zionist lobby because it's not just the lobby, it's not APAC just uh, injecting $100 million. It's also all of these major corporations that can be uh, influenced uh, and are influential in politics. And that's millions and billions of dollars of wealth that Muslims don't have to operate at that level of these uh, major corporations, these major industries, for example, um, that are influenced by donors and board members of Zionist persuasion. So that's how like this idea of, well, politics is just about merit. And oh, if you win the election, you, you, you do your grassroots effort and you're in Congress and then you're going to have a seat at the table. That's not really the reality of politics. The, and I think the current war in Gaza proves that because the majority of people in the U.S., uh, are against uh, the war. They're against the continuing war against uh, uh, Palestinians. But why is there a kind of unanimous pro-Israel bent and policy within Washington if electoral politics is supposed to represent the will of the people? Clearly it doesn't and clearly it never has. So what is really uh, being represented in the halls of Congress? It's money and power and influence. And Muslims just don't have that level of money and power to be able to influence Washington. But that doesn't mean we don't have any influence on politics because we can still uh, create media, we can still create narratives, we can still influence pe the way people think, the what values people have. We can uh, make a compelling case to people about what is right and wrong. And I think uh, it has been because of uh, the effort of a lot of Muslims and non-Muslims that the narrative has changed on Palestine, on Israel, and that has its own trickle-down effect. Um, but I know that you said that we should get beyond narrative changing, and inshallah that will happen, but um, I don't think the path is through putting more and more resources into you know trying to get another Muslim or another hijabi woman into Congress. You were talking about potentially establishing a think tank 
and how there should be more investment, not in these big fancy masajid, as we're seeing pop up around the country, but into media institutions and think tanks. Can you talk more about that? I was saying that there seems to be a resource management management problem in the American Muslim community. A lot of wealth is being um, funneled into building buildings. And I don't think that this is a very strategic way to plan for the future. I think that a lot of in a lot of cities, the Muslim community is growing, but it's mainly due to immigration. It's not so much due to um, a pre previous immigrant generation uh, having a lot of devoted Muslim children. I wish that were the case, but I don't really see signs of that. I think that the burgeoning of the Muslim population is mainly through immigration. And if that's the case, then at some point, you know, whether it's because of immigration policy getting tighter in the U.S. or the U.S. is suffer some kind of economic collapse where it's no longer a popular destination for immigrants to come to the U.S., those immigration numbers are going to dip or even collapse. And when that happens, if that happens, then uh, what what of all these big buildings, these big masajid? that people have spent millions to build and they're empty for most of the week you know they're empty for most of the week they only get filled maybe for friday prayers and instead of having this big building why don't you have something more modest and redirect some of those resources to other types of projects that will preserve the faith of the coming muslim generations clearly there is a big problem of muslims being able to convey islam uh, holy and consistently to the next generation and the next generation after that. That requires institutions that go beyond, oh, this is just a big uh, building. This is a big a masjid. Um, so w there was another conversation that I had with some Muslim friends where they were saying, you know, all of these plots and plans that we see from the enemies of Islam, it's like our enemies are just geniuses. Mm -hmm. Like our enemies are just so... Uh, you know, two steps ahead and they're so smart, like they are just geniuses. And they were just befuddled by this. And I told them that, look, it's not inherent genius that our enemies have. You have to actually dedicate resources to strategy, towards research, towards thinking, towards developing, analyzing. And that's what our enemies do. They, they spend hundreds of millions annually on their think tanks. Literally, the war on terror was developed in a think tank, RAND. And people are generally aware of RAND, but they don't know how RAND operates. RAND is very well funded. They advise the U.S. government and the U.S. military. Uh, but there's all of this money that comes to fund uh, hundreds of these RAND scholars who are doing research and writing and completing PhDs. Where is the Muslim equivalent of that? Um, and that's kind of a sign of an immature community. Like you have the wealth, it's not like we're poor, but that wealth is not advancing our interests. There, that wealth is not advancing the Islamic interests. Um, building masajid is very good and very important, and we, we need to do that. But how much of our resources, what percentage should be going towards that, as opposed to building media institutions, building research institutions, building propaganda institutions, these kinds of things that are very vital for advancing the interests of any community politically, uh, we don't see as much of that, unfortunately. Where is the investment is the question that I ask. And with Muslim Skeptic, we're trying to do the think tank side of it, the research, um, the, the um, strategizing, the analysis, the debate, that's what we are focused on. So it sounds like we have the wealth, but we don't have the wisdom that these are short-sighted solutions to a problem of just overpopulation. The, the parking lots are <laughs> full and we need to house more Muslims. Yeah, I agree. I think there, there does need to be more investment in these types of institutions. And I think there is an issue. I think a, a lot of Muslims are lost, but subhanAllah, I think naturally still people are gravitating back they have no choice in life you have to fall back on what you were raised on those values that help guide you through life and like i've seen just the cause of palestine take a lot of people who weren't really practicing muslims but were muslim grew up muslim they just don't practice but they're falling back onto their faith and their community 
And I met one guy, he's Palestinian himself, and he told me my entire life I have never cared about Islam and I've never cared about Palestine. Never. Oh. Just because I was just living my life doing my thing. And there's been all these little, these issues before. But when this genocide started taking place, it shook me awake. And I imagine there are many other people like him. So I'd like to... Now, one other point. Go um, ahead. Yeah, about please. About the importance of our own research, our own strategizing. If we don't do it, others are going to do it for us. And they're going to make prescriptions for us. And we're not going to be smart enough or informed enough to know that, well, we're being led down a dangerous path or we're being given advice that's actually not going to benefit us. It's actually going to destroy us. Mm. We're following a Pied Piper, basically, by accepting the research of others. And this is why we have to have our own intellectual resources. You know, we talk about like human resources, but there also needs to be intellectual resources developed in the Muslim community. And it's it's really shocking with, if you look at the state of uh, universities even in the Muslim world. Um, I can't point really to many institutions, definitely not more than three, two or three, that you can really say this is like an independent minded research institution that they're pursuing, you know, the, a kind of uh, research methodology that is informed by Islam and it's like serving Islamic interests. In reality, most of the universities are just taking a Western model and they're just feeding Western narratives like, OK, let's talk about why extremism is a problem for Muslims. Let's talk about like why we need more you know, women's rights and, and all of this stuff in, in the Muslim world. Um, that's like that's a Western agenda. And Muslims can talk about like, OK, mistreatment of Muslim women, but do it on Islamic terms, not in this kind of liberal human rights discourse that is using that's being used to colonize the Muslim world. You're just taking that agenda and you're doing it in, in a Muslim research university. That's not good enough. We have to be independent minded. Where's the research that shows, OK, the disaster of Western colonialism, how they have. They claim to be so intellectually superior, but actually when we analyze liberalism and secularism and scientism, materialism, evolution, these things all have intellectual problems. They have all kinds of holes in the narrative, you could say, and we can critique that on an Islamic basis. And that's how we justify and defend Islam as the message of God. Like we claim that and we make grand statements about Islam as a way of life. But what are the, what are the intellectual arguments to back that? And is, in Islamic history, we have a long history of scholars, uh, ulama, and and thinkers who would back up that statement. They would critique other religions, they would critique other ideologies, and they would write tomes, volumes about how Islam is superior, how Islam is rationally more compelling than like Greek, uh, you know, thinking or Greek religion or Christianity or Judaism. We have to revive that, but we can't do that if we just take a liberal Western intellectual paradigm and try to, in a very superficial way, Islamify it. We have to have our own independent intellectual resources in order to take that position of leadership in the world that we once had. Otherwise, we're just going to be followers and it's going to lead us to our destruction. Speaking of critiquing Western ideologies, you tweeted this about Richard Dawkins, who the other day he told the LBC, if I had to choose between Christianity and Islam, I'd choose Christianity every single time. And he said this in response to, uh, I think, Oxford Street putting up lights for Ramadan, but not necessarily doing so for Easter. So you tweeted, you said, new atheist Sam Harris is on record as saying that Judaism is better than Christianity, which is better than Islam. New atheist Richard Dawkins seems to hold a similar view. In other words, the new atheist movement is not really about attack attacking all religions, but rather attacking Islam and to a lesser extent Christianity while ignoring Judaism. It will be noted that the new atheists never engage in any serious critique of the Talmud or the role of Judaism in legitimizing Israel's policies of apartheid and genocide. Can you elaborate more on this? You can think about it in these terms, uh, just to make it very simple. Uh, you have organizations like the ADL, 
and you have these kinds of anti-extremist watchdog groups and they'll point out that there's a big problem with Islamism, like Islamic extremism. What is Islamism or Islamic extremism? It's the idea of political Islam. The idea that, yeah, we want governments that care about Islam. We want Islam to be represented at the level of a nation. There isn't any government. All of the Muslim countries that we have are, are based on this nation state model of a specific ethnicity or race. And it's not you know, on the basis of Islam. So why can't we have a Muslim nation? That's been deemed extremism, Islamism, and it's been critiqued by all of these Zionist forces. Now there's increasing critique of Christian nationalism. If you believe that a nation should be uh, run on the basis of Christianity or Christian principles, that's also extremism. That is also something where we are going to monitor you. We're going to put you on an extremism list, a hate list, that you are preaching hate because you think that there can be a state that's operating under Christian doctrine. Uh, why is, where is the same kind of attitude or treatment about Jewish extremism, the idea of a Jewish state, the idea of a state run by Jewish principles. Obviously, we don't find any similar critique. Why? Because that's Zionism. That's Zionism. And all of these new atheists like Sam Harris or Richard Dawkins, they want to critique uh, Islam and to a lesser extent Christianity, but they never extend the same arguments, the same critiques against Judaism. Sometimes it's because they are Jews themselves, like Sam Harris has a Jewish background, um, Christopher Hitchens, Bill Maher, uh, one of the biggest new atheist type of critiques. He doesn't bring up, he, he'll cite the Quran, he'll cite uh, Islamic practices, uh, he'll criticize and mock Christianity, but has very little to say about the same beliefs and the same practices found in Judaism. That seems like a very glaring blind spot. And I was actually reminded of this kind of hypocrisy recently. Um, There's another podcast, Fresh and Fit, and they brought in this kind of rabid Zionist Islamophobe, uh, Laura Loomer. Mm -hmm. And she was making all these comments about, oh, Islam is misogynistic. Islam is a violent terroristic religion. She was going off and getting very little pushback in, in that particular podcast. And so I challenged her. I said, I'll debate you. You want to talk about misogyny? You want to talk about uh, religion being violent? Let's talk about Islam versus Judaism. And then she said, no, 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 I don't want to talk about religion. You know, I, I, I responded, what do you mean you don't want to talk about religion? You were talking about religion. You had a lot to say about religion when it came to Islam. But as soon as we bring Judaism into the picture, last time I checked, Judaism was also a religion with scriptures and with books and teachings and a long tradition. Why can't we talk about that religion? And she's not like a particularly religious person. But just because you're not religious in practicing Judaism, that doesn't mean you can't talk about Judaism. So this double standard in the kind of atheistic movement or the secular critique of religion it, there's a glaring blind spot and it's a double standard and we have to really call it out uh, because if we don't call it out, that's what actually perpetuates a kind of marginalization of Muslims, Islamophobia, and eventually the genocides of the Muslim people that we've seen for over 200 years. Mm. I don't have any other questions, Daniel. Is there anything that you would like to add to this or do you have any closing statement? Well, I've appreciated talking with you. Um, if I made any mistakes, some of the things I just was going off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. So anyone can fact check me and correct anything that I said that I was mistaken. But I really enjoyed uh, speaking with you. And mashallah, it seems like you have a good team, a good operation. And I'm expecting very big things from what you can do and accomplish. Uh, right now, you have a certain vision, a certain path. Maybe in 10 years, that path will be different. But I expect in the end, inshallah, with the barakah of Allah, that you're going to accomplish some big things just keep that vision the ambition the big goals that you have because that's the kind of you know energy that the muslim community needs and i wish you all the best i make dua that allah blesses you protects you puts barakah in everything that you do and i really i'm so happy to have met you and I wish you all the best. Jazakallah khair. Inshallah, I really appreciate you saying that. It's very kind of you to say. And I hope that, you know, we don't take, uh, we don't claim to represent the Muslim community, but obviously we come from the Muslim community. And so we'll do our best. Uh, 
but I really appreciate you saying that, and we hope to live up to those expectations. It was a pleasure having you as well. Before meeting you and actually talking to you, all I heard were terrible things, <laughs> and I'm sure people are wondering, Ahmed, why don't you put back, uh, push back on maybe certain things that you have said, but I don't have the ability to do so. I have these conversations first and foremost to educate myself and then share that with everyone else. And so uh, in the comment section, I'm sure people <laughs> agree or disagree on many different things, especially about the Mahdi in the end times. But uh, all in all, it's been a, a wonderful experience having you here. And I, and I look forward to collaborating with you, you know, further in the future and seeing what great work comes out of the Muslim skeptic. Inshallah. So, well, yeah, thank you so much for being here. All right, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Trust nothing. Mm -hmm.